our opening here and hold the whole evening turn. We should have two pieces there for you to work out of. One is actually the order of service here, which gives you a general format of the service in general. Then the holding evening turn is the actual service that we will be going by. All right. There will be a part will be once again going into group one, group two. We'll guide you through that as we get to that point. But for now, all this will be this together. Here we go. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. Thank you. 
spirits come before you, O God, as incense. And may your presence surround and fill us, so that in union with all creation we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Amen. Right. We are still in the book of Romans yet tonight. And we're going to be taking a look at the uh, book of Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. And we're going to be talking about how God is in the world. Our passage from the book of Romans today tells us that God has placed knowledge of himself within every person. And that the knowledge of God is also plainly evident in his creation. So because of these truths, God has then made every person responsible for responding to this knowledge of him that is within every person and within his creation. Let's take a look at these words from the Apostle Paul in Romans Chapter 1, starting in verse 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see the invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. <clears throat> yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. The Apostle Paul is saying here that God is most definitely in this world and shows himself in his creation. However, people have chosen to ignore and blatantly suppress this knowledge of God. And thus, they reject this outer realization of God and instead choose to follow their own desires and thoughts. So Paul explains that there are three evidences of God presented in our text for today. Now the first evidence of God is the righteous anger of God. Verse 18 tells us this, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The Bible has revealed to us the gospel of salvation, which is a faith in Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross for our sins. That's the good news. However, we also have the bad news, which is why people so desperately need to be saved. The Bible proves this need by showing that people are in themselves destitute of any righteousness that will satisfy God's just standard. And the reality is, until a person is persuaded that their condition is one of being totally lost, they are not likely to be concerned about any kind of deliverance. So the Apostle Paul tells us in these verses of the assessment of the human condition and humanity's inability to rectify this condition on its own. And just as the gospel reveals the truth of God's righteousness, verse 18 then supplies us with the truth of God's anger. God's saving power can only be appreciated when seen in the context of his opposition to evil. Now, the word used here for God's anger is the word orgao, which means an anger that is in opposition to something. Because of the possessive syntax of this word, this anger comes from God himself. <laughs> the word expresses God's abiding 
in continuous opposition to evil. So the anger of God is his determined purpose to be in opposition to sin. God's anger is the result of all those who are in rebellion to him and would distort and destroy his great and gracious will. God hates sin deeply. And because he is a just and righteous God, sin's disobedience requires that a penalty is to be paid. And the greatest display, the greatest display and revelation of God's righteous anger is seen in Jesus' substitutionary death for mankind's sin. At the cross, God poured out his judgment upon his one and only son to be the sacrifice, which is the only means, the only means by which fallen humanity might be redeemed from sin's curse and God's righteous anger. So verse 18 tells us that God's righteous anger is against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now the word wickedness comes from the Greek word adikia, which means doing actions which are contrary to God's righteous judgments. A wicked people are those people who have a lack of reverence or obedience to God and do not give God his proper place in their life, and so are intentionally rebellious towards him. Whenever the truth about God starts to exert itself within people, it starts to make them uneasy in their moral nature. Now these wicked people then try to hold down this moral uneasiness within themselves and suppress it. Because they really don't want to see what God is revealing within themselves. So wicked people then try to devise ways to hide those truths. Not only to themselves, but to others as well. And the thing is, to suppress the truth actually means that these people have a knowledge of the truth. But have decided to reject it rather than rectify it. This brings us to the second evidence of God, and that is the internal evidence of God. The Apostle Paul says this in verse 19. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. Scripture tells us that human guilt is not because God chooses to remain hidden from the activities of humanity. Rather, God chooses to be so deeply involved in the activities of people that he makes his will known in everything that people do. And so, guilt then arises in those people who are in contradiction to his will, and they reject him and choose to suppress that guilt instead. Verse 19 affirms that all people have internal God-given evidence of his existence and his just and righteous nature, and also that it has been made obvious to them. Now, the Greek word used here for obvious is the word phanaru, which means to make apparent and in open view. And that's what makes the suppression of truth wicked. Because people do not do these irreverent things in ignorance. For in their hearts and consciences, God created the knowledge of him, who he is and what he is like. A good example of this comes from the good people at the Barney Institute. They performed a study and found out that 98% of people across the globe believe in some kind of a higher power or being. 98%. I'm thinking that it seems to be an obvious statistic that God has made it obvious to them. Every person has internally within themselves the natural 
and moral revelation of God and is fully able to comprehend any manifestations or revelations from God. And this is an inter internal evidence for each and every person who lived and lives that God is indeed in this world. Now here's something to consider. There's a small bird about five inches long. It's kind of cut off on top. It's called a white-throated warbler, which summers in Germany and winters in Africa. As the days grow short, the adult birds head south, leaving their little ones behind. Several weeks later, the young fly across thousands of miles of unfamiliar land and sea to join their parents. How do they find a place totally unknown to them? Experiments have shown that the, that the young birds have an instinctive knowledge of latitude, longitude, and an ability to tell directions from the stars and by the stars. God has given these young birds internally a calendar, a clock, and all the navigational data that they need to fly those thousands of uncharted miles to their parents' side. And the Creator God, who did that all in a bird's brain, has done so much more within us. The evolutionist says that our amazing and complex world developed by chance. However, is this easier to accept than to believe that God created this amazing world and thousands of other such create creatures. The Lord testifies through the Apostle Paul that his outward, visible manifestation of himself is universally known by each and every person. It is an internal evidence that God has placed within each of them. So this then brings us to the third evidence of God in this world, and that is the external evidence of God. Verse 20 tells us this. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. The knowledge of every person the, the knowledge every person possesses is not simply that there is a God. But as verse 20 says, a knowledge that they can clearly see his eternal power, his divine nature, and his attributes. God's revelation of himself can be fully understood through creation by everyone. Nature shows us a God of might, intelligence, and intricate detail. Creation reveals a God of order and beauty, and a God who controls powerful forces. Now, some scientists say there is no God, and that all the wonders around you are accidental, and that no almighty hand was involved in making a thousand million stars and hundreds of millions of galaxies. They say that these stars made themselves. These same scientists also say that the surface of our, our land just happened to have topsoil, without which we would have no vegetables to eat, no grass for the animals whose meat is our food then. We have a day and night because the earth spins at a constant speed, without slowing down, and is at just the right tilt of an angle to give us our seasons and to have the greatest exposure of land areas for habitation to occur across the globe. Again, some scientists say that it's just an accident of nature. And that's just the world we live in. What about us? How is it that a human
human heart will beat for 70, 80, or more years without faltering and keeping perfect beat. How is it that this thing here, how is it that the human tongue has such flexibility to form words? And then have a brain to even understand these words. An accident? There is no God? That's what some people say. However, Scripture says, in my Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Scripture also says in Psalm 14, verse 1, only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. Here's a great poem that tells it all. The greatness of our God is seen in sky and sea and forest green, and living creatures, great and small, reveal the God who made them all. The truth is, folks, that the design of creation points to the master designer. For God's wisdom is plainly observable in the works of his creation. God's handiwork in nature speaks so strongly for his existence and power that it is a powerful argument in establishing man's guilt and condemnation when this truth is rejected. So Paul wrote, that a person is without excuse if they do not respond in faith to the external evidence that God is in the world. Psalm 19, verse 1, echoes the tr this truth with the words, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display His craftsmanship. Does anyone have an excuse for not believing in God? The Bible Answers an emphatic, no. God has revealed what he is like in and through his creation. Every person, therefore, consciously either accepts or rejects God. Now, with these three evidences that God is, is indeed in this world, let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul says about the subsequent vain speculations of humanity. Let's take a look at verse 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Each and every person possesses some internal knowledge of God. However, there are many who choose to rebel and reject this knowledge. Therefore, God is justified in his anger and judgment because of pe people's willful rejection of him. God wants to forgive and restore the sinner. However, being the righteous and just God that he is, he cannot ignore or condone such willful rebellion. So, the evidence is before us. God's righteous anger, his internal evidence, and his external evidence. The choice is completely up to you and to every person alive today. Jesus is asking you, just as he asked Martha in John chapter 11, verse 26 of our gospel text on Sunday, do you believe this? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the abundance of evidence that you have placed in your creation and in our hearts that you are indeed in this world. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget that, that you designed each one of us, even to the numbering of the hairs on our heads. Father God, help us and give us the words to say whenever people are placed into our lives that do not see you in the magnificent, magnificence and the beauty of this world. And we pray this in the holy name of your one and only Son, Jesus.
Amen. Let's now go to a time of prayer. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you for your evidence, your internal evidence that you have in our hearts, and we thank you for the external evidence of the, the beauty of this world. Today, it's this gorgeous day. We see, we see the tulips coming through the ground. The promise of life after death. That's your promise to us. Sitting right in front of us. We see it. We who are here tonight, we see it. We see you in that. Lord, help us. Help us to spread that word as we go outside those doors into our mission to you. That you are in this world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father God, we pray for all those churches who are trying to stand upon your truth this Lenten season. Lord, let them preach the truth of Easter, which is your son dying on the cross for our sins on Good Friday and arising from the dead on Easter Sunday morning is a promise to each one of us that all who believe in him will have the forgiveness of our sins and the promise of eternal life in heaven with him when our time this earth is past. Lord, let the church stand upon that and that truth alone this Easter season. Give them strength. Give strength to the congregations, to the church leaders, and especially to the pastors, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those who are ill in health at this time, whether that be in body, mind, or spirit. Father God, send down your healing spirit to all those people who are on our hearts at this time. Lord, we pray especially for those people who are grieving for lost loved ones at this time. Lord, we pray especially for the Stevens and family. We pray for, for Joanne, Joanne's family and the loss of her sister. Lord, we pray for all of those people who mourn when they go to a funeral at this time and digs up memories of yeah, people lost. Jean's still hurting for the loss of her sister. Lord, pray her peace. Bring all those people who are hurting right now from loss of loved ones, even though they have the promise and they know that they're in heaven. Lord, we still hurt and we mourn for ourselves. Bring us your peace, Lord, and bring us your strength. And bring your healing touch to all of us who are on our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for this nation we've turned away from you, Lord. And uh, we can continue to stand as a congregation and we will continue to pray for this nation and for the leader. The leaders that they make decisions in accordance to your will and not a will of their own agenda. Lord, this nation was built upon the promises of your holy word. And it is still in you that we trust. And we are still consider ourselves one nation under God. Help us, Lord, to continue to pray for this nation and its leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for all those soldiers who are fighting for those freedoms we enjoy in this, uh, in this nation. Lord, protect them, Father. Protect them. Bring them home. Reunite them with the families, Lord. And then help us as a nation to stand by them as they stood by for us, Lord. We want to be able to transition back into society, help us to be able to supply them with jobs, Lord. Give them any kind of healing that they need, whether that is in body, mind, or spirit, Lord. And help them as they've helped us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for all those missionaries that we support individually and as a congregation. Lord, especially we pray for um, Paul and Lee Eldred in Turkey. As they're back to doing the, the ministries you've called them to again. Lord, we pray for Tina and Marty Ganon as uh, they're waiting to go back and reunite with the people in East Africa who are uh, still in battle with the Ebola virus over there, Lord. And so we pray that you can protect those people who are close to them over there. And of course, we pray uh, for safe travel for them as they go back. Lord, we pray for uh, Jim and Sherry Levine, friends of mine, missionary friends of mine who are in the Dominican Republic, and also Pastor A and Judy Foster who are in Haiti doing, Haiti doing those awesome ministries that you have called them to. Lord, pray for Heidi Olson in China. And she is just pounding your word when baptisms and, and uh, bringing the, your, your gospel to people who are in such need of it over there. Father, pray for all of these missionaries that, that we support. Protect them, Lord. Protect their health and the health of their families. Father, protect them from any kind of human evil and any evil of sin. And Lord God, find them pleased with the resources that they do, need to do those ministries you have called each of them to do. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for families. During this Lenten season, the devil is messing with us. Lord, we just pray for protection of families. The devil knows that this is the time of year when people get closer to you. And so he's messing with us. 
Lord, we pray a protection on the families. Keep them together. Let them draw closer to you and find their strength in you, Lord. Protect the parents, protect the children, keep the family strong. Lord, in your mercy. If there's anyone who has any prayers that they'd like to make at this time, please go ahead and say it. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for everyone who's going to the, uh, the event at North Heights Lutheran Church this Saturday. Pray for safe travel for everyone. Let them have a joyous time together. Let them have an absolutely wonderful time in celebration of the truth that is within the Easter, the Easter story. Protect them, Lord. Let them have a great time, Lord. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for Don and Larry at this time that uh, seem to have similar infections of the lungs that the doctors don't know where it comes from, or if they do, they, they, they're not quite putting the finger around. Lord, help them find the answers to those infections. Let those antibiotics work. Just put your healing touch upon them and start that healing process within them that it doesn't get any worse and nothing else comes out of it, Lord. Be with them and touch them, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. these prayers, Lord, that uh, we said out loud in these prayer, prayers that we have in our hearts, Lord, we know you here. We trust them in the mercy of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let us refer back now to our order of service in the Holden Evening Prayer. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it.
Thanks be to God. 